Thank you. Uh, so I'm uh, <coughs> kind of pleased though that I can tell you about tests uh, remotely. Uh, the first slide, which I hope is showing, uh, gives a summary of uh, what I hope to speak, but also I'd like to emphasize that the team uh, that I'm represented is comprised by more than a dozen uh, institutions. And the people who are part of this team um, have contributed more than a million person hours of effort over the past five years to make tests the reality that it now is. So um, if you can see my second slide, I'd like you to give a quick uh, preamble to what I'm going to be showing you and, and a status overview for tests as it stands now. Um, the satellite is in orbit and the sky survey is underway. The launch back in April was very uh, successful with the commission following on for the next couple of months. Uh, the resonant orbit that we achieved is absolutely spot on and um, the, there's no concern about eclipses by either the moon or the earth and uh, the instruments are working really, really well. Uh, the camera focus and stability is excellent. We're meeting all of the objectives that we originally had hoped for for the performance of the cameras. Um, the attitude control system is working well, and one pleasant surprise was that the data compression is much better than what we had uh, planned for, and as a result, we're able to store uh, more data for orbit than, than it originally been planned. Uh, the cosmic ray rejection works well, and, and what we stand currently is that we completed um, eight of the sectors uh, in the survey, and sector nine is now in progress, so we're more than 25% of the way through the, the survey as a whole. Uh, just to give you a brief uh, reminder of the differences between TESS and Kepler as shown in this, uh, this next cartoon, uh, TESS is doing a shallow wide survey of the solar neighborhood uh, in contrast to the deep narrow search uh, for uh, one four hundred in the sky that's carried out in the Kepler main mission. This is what TESS actually looks like uh, as it was prepared for launch um, a couple of months uh, before going to Cape Canaveral. Uh, in the central portion, you can see the four cameras and they were prepared with uh, lenses on them. The solar panels are deployed and then facing sort of toward you in the lower part of the image is the cave and uh, dish with the protective cover. So the, the satellite was then rolled, uh, was, was transported to Cape Canaveral for its launch and the launch took place in, uh, on uh, April 18th, uh, and uh, everything worked extremely well. The uh, uh, test is in a lunar resonance, the over two orbit, so called, it's a 13.7 day uh, period, and these uh, check marks indicate all the advantages that we're accruing from being in this orbit. I won't go through these in detail, but the thermal stability of the instruments has been incredible. 30 millikelvin per day with passive control only, and the three points that are mentioned at the bottom of the list of the point stability, the station keeping uh, without any uh, propellant being required, and the high element rates are really key to the, to the science that we're getting out of tests. Uh, one of the things about the orbit is this lunar resonant orbit is there's a plot that shows the uh, height of the perigee is a function of year uh, on the uh, x-axis and, and um, one of the key things that you, you can see is this uh, oscillatory pattern with a period of about uh, eight to ten years and this is uh, those oscillations are uh, a manifestation of, of uh, cosine mechanism and they're actually uh, uh, the, that, that's one of the factors that we have to take into account in order to stabilize the, the orbit and it's really worked out very well. So the bottom line is the orbit is stable uh, for uh, more than 25 years and in fact even for things like momentum adjust, we've actually got uh, more than a century's worth of, uh, of propellant that's, that's still on the satellite. So everything's on that part is working really well. Uh, as far as the photometric precision that we're actually uh, getting in order that that's what this plot shows as a function of test magnitude. Test magnitudes are approximately high band because test covers the uh, fast band from six tenths of a micron to one micron. And uh, the one hour photometric precision is what's shown here. Um, the requirement that we, that we had was to achieve
key 230 parts familiar that have had a magnitude of, of plus 10. In reality, we got to 200. And then furthermore, the residual systematic requirement was about 60 parts per million, but we actually uh, achieved a, a number that's about three times better than that. So it's comparable in terms of photometric precision to what was achieved by, by Kepler. So we we're really pleased with that. Uh, commissioning was completed in uh, 2000, in uh, July, uh, July 24th, and we started the survey right after. And uh, just to remind you, the survey does these 13 sectors, each 24 degrees wide by 96 degrees uh, tall, with one of the cameras being centered on the uh, the pole. Um, this diagram shows what we'll be doing in the, in the second year when we're looking at the northern hemisphere. And um, basically, this shows the exposures that we have as a, as a function of uh, uh, ecliptic uh, latitude uh, with the overlaps taken into account. The, and uh, of course, the web uh, continuous viewing zone is one of the things that TESS will be looking at uh, continuously for almost a year. This is the uh, first slide image that we got uh, shortly as we started the uh, first survey. The stripe right in the middle, uh, you can see, is that same pattern of the four cameras laid out. And camera four, the one closest to the bottom, uh, then it's uh, blown up and it's a, a display on the lower right hand corner, and that's the large natural land cloud. And the labels that I put up now actually show what all the other objects are during this uh, first uh, measurement that we made at sector one. This is a 30 minute uh, full frame image to spot down and, and display. Uh, the first sector is shown in this, uh, in this next plot, uh, and then at the, um, as, the, as the survey proceeds, you move from sector one uh, all the way across uh, sectors uh, three through uh, uh, 13, completing the first year. And then if you look at the same uh, representation in celestial coordinates rather than in ecliptic coordinates, you get this pattern where I've uh, shown the, uh, the, known, the previously known um, planets from ground based surveys that we're, uh, we're, that we're actually regularly uh, monitoring. We, we, we see these sources at very high signal and noise because typically they're, they were uh, Jupiter or Saturn size planets. And then this little stripe that's shown in blue uh, is north of the celestial equator and it indicates for sectors four through eight that northern hemisphere telescopes have been able to participate in the follow up program. Uh, the information that the data that's been uh, deposited at uh, mass now comprises the first six sectors. Uh, seven is ready to deliver, and altogether we, we have information already on about 8,000 square degrees, and 50 million are in balance going all the way down to 18th magnitude. Um, and of course, one of the things that we've seen is the continuous viewing, so for the large natural land cloud, we have six months. There's a lot of science being done in that particular area. So far, the number of TOIs that we, we that we've reported uh, that have been posted up at uh, uh, at mass is uh, more than 400, and the listing that's shown uh, indicates the the portions of pipeline that have been, that have been used to uh, to produce these. And um, the bottom line is that we've got mass measurements now on nine planets, and there are mass measurements underway for about another 40 planet candidates that there's high probability that we'd be able to get mass connections on, on, on a major fraction of that 40. Uh, this is just a clue, just an indication of, the, of how the uh, publications for tests are, are trending. Um, uh, since January 1, there have been 37 publications posted on mass for a PhD. So we're running about one publication every two days. So, so it's really starting to ramp up. Um, and we're really pleased at, at the way that the community is responding to the data. Okay, so just in case you only think of tests as, as being devoted to X planets, there's a lot of new information on transient that we're able to, uh, to, to bring forward. Uh, this is a plot that actually shows uh, other types of time variable objects that TEST is able to study, both um, solar system, um, galactic sources and, and in addition, uh, extra galactic sources. Um, and in particular, for the sensitivity for the full frame images, which have a 
30 minute uh, base exposure. Uh, we get 10% photometry and 18 magnitude for about 300 million uh, stars and galaxies. And if we actually stack the successive uh, 30 minute uh, images, we can get down to fainter uh, uh, than 19.5 uh, magnitude. In fact, for eight hours, we've actually been able to measure that we get down to um, a limited magnitude, fainter than 20 magnitude. The plot there at the bottom shows the, uh, the run of, of sensitivity and parts per million for an hour integration as a function of uh, apparent magnitude. So the test is really uh, proving itself as a, uh, uh, as a faint uh, source um, uh, system as well as a bright source system for looking at small exoplanet uh, And so uh, this is a plot from Matthew Castlewall that uh, actually shows what some of the extragalactic transit transients uh, are that we can, can look at. And then you put this, that you sort of try to indicate where, there, where there's discovery space, that's what the question marks show. And then finally, <coughs> you, uh, we examine for the luminosities that are shown on the right side of this uh, of this plot, uh, what we might be able to find as a function of distance. Uh, we can go from the Magellanic clouds all the way out to the Coleman cluster, a high expectation being able to find these fancy events. To give you some idea of something that we've already seen, uh, this plot is again that same picture from first light, and this is a composition that uh, Michael Fastenau uh, put together that actually shows the supernovae that we've been detecting. And uh, I would say you can see it all at 18 QK. This is, this is all in that, so in, in camera two. And then, um, uh, so there were a total of three uh, transients that showed up in that supernovae. And then uh, similarly, there was a transient over in uh, the, the vicinity of, uh, uh, of the LFC. And then a second one there. And then all together there were six just in the first um, the first couple of sectors. And uh, since then there have been about 35 more that are in the process. Now these are exactly the scientific value of this is that in these particular uh, examples they were actually uh, discovered and alerted um, to the TNS by ground-based observers. But then we looked uh, back in the test um, the, the test data that had been taken concurrently, and we're able to actually see the supernova actually turn off, and that information was not available to the ground based observers uh, until we actually uh, report this information. Um, so, looking forward to where uh, TESS uh, falls in uh, the, uh, the timeline for the next decade, uh, we're right now in the midst of prime mission in that little block shown in the upper left hand corner. Uh, in the southern hemisphere, and we're about half, halfway through that. For the northern hemisphere, then it will run from uh, June of this year till uh, July of uh, 2020, and then we're proposing right now for the extended mission. Uh, Kiosk, which you just heard about, is uh, going to launch at the end of 2019 and will be uh, overlapping very nicely with the Kiosk mission. Uh, Web is coming up and we'll be able to help with. Uh, uh, good targets for web and, and their you know, continuous viewing zone. We're doing atmospheric studies. Uh, LIGO uh, is, uh, is operating during a period of time of both uh, this prime mission and the first extended mission. The LSSC is going to come online. The, the next generation large telescopes are going to come uh, later on, and they would be part of an extended mission, assuming that's what happened. And then finally, at the end of the decade, uh, Plato would come into play. So um, I'd like to just uh, close by um, advertising a science conference that we're planning to have at MIT uh, this uh, July. I'd like to invite everyone to come and, and, uh, and join us in the celebration of the first year of TESS operations. And then finally, um, uh, the people in the test team are really happy to uh, accept the torch that's being passed from uh, Kepler, and we're uh, really excited about being able to, to, to continue the, the vital and, uh, and exciting work that's going on in this new field. So, thank you very much. Okay, are there any questions for George Rector? I think I'm going to 
anyone wants to come up to say them, um, speak up. Okay. Yeah, to, uh, Tom, if you could uh, repeat the question. There, there are echoes in the room, so there are questions, and uh, it's hard for me to, to, to hear them unless you repeat them. When that supernova was detected, why was there a delay for the people on the ground watching it?